Well, come some go on, somebody. Come on, somebody. Give the Lord a shout in this house. <laughs> Amen. So good to see you this morning. Thank you for joining us. Those of you who are watching us online, give them a hand clap as well if you would. Amen. I want to get right into today's session because I know you are excited about the snow and you want to get out there and have a snowball fight. You want to get out there and build a snowman. Okay, no. You want to go eat. Okay, yeah, there we go. A lot of agreement in that last one. Amen. Um, you know, throughout my childhood, I was always talking to God. If I wasn't talking to Him, I was talking to somebody about Him. That was as natural then to me as it is today. And I believe in part that's the, one, of the, one of the few reasons of why I've had many experiences with the kingdom dimension. Many of you heard me tell a few of the many stories that I have about experiencing the results from this invisible dimension and receiving the manifestation that came from the unseen realm where you stood back and you went, only God could have done that. Amen? And certainly as, I've, as I have shared some of those stories with you, uh, I know that on the inside of you, you thought the same thing. Well, I remember one day, I was now an adult, and I asked the Holy Spirit, why does it seem like that this has been a pattern in my life, that I've been positioned in one situation after another where I needed a sign, a wonder, a miracle, a healing. I needed uh, some kind of manifestation that could only be produced as a result from the kingdom dimension. Or why is it that you put me with so many people and I'm in a relationship with them that they needed the same thing? Why is that? Why? And he said to me, because your mother trained you to be sensitive about the kingdom of God and this kingdom dimension. He says, God, I remember... And he began, as I began to reflect, he began to explain my life to me. And he said, you would come inside the house and immediately, your mother would be on the other side of the house. You'd come inside and you would sense the presence of God. Well, you didn't step back outside. No, you were attracted to it. You were drawn to it. And you would go over there. How many times have you seen your mother in the middle of the room on her knees and for two or three hours, never say a word. And yet the presence of God was so thick on her and in the room that it showed up as a fog, as a smoke. It's true. He said she would go inward and her thought life would be directed to me. Her soul would be directed to me. And her inner world with, would intermingle with my world. Amen. Amen. He said, you've got to experience many of those things. She not only had an awareness for me, she had a deep affection for me. It wasn't, you were a bystander of the experience that came because of her deep affection for me. You're, you didn't have deep affection, but you had a sensitivity. And so I allowed you to participate. Now, it's not that she... You know, every time she would train you, it's not that she would pull out the Bible and say, see this, this, this. No, huh? she, she showed you with her life. She didn't prove it in Scripture to you until, you know, but, there, but in segments there would be times she'd say, see this in the Word, see this in the Word, see this in the Bible. This is what I'm experiencing, see? And so this is what you're experiencing. Amen? Now, again, he said to me, it wasn't your deep affection that brought you into those experiences. It was hers. And you as a bystander, I allowed you to participate. Now, you were drawn to that. You developed a super sensitivity towards that. And because of that, today, today, those ex experiences have given you an equal faith to those kingdom to the kingdom dimension. Did you hear what I said? Those experiences have given you an equal faith.
to the kingdom dimension, to what you've experienced or encountered in the kingdom dimension. See, whatever you experience from the kingdom, from this invisible realm, your faith rises to that level and it should never shrink or drop from that level ever again. And yet it happens. And yet it happens in so many people, so many Christians, because their faith is temporary. Amen? Instead of ongoing. Amen? We should always be reaching up. We should always be reaching up. We should always be reaching up. And so he said to me, the greater the kingdom encounters, the greater the anointing available. You didn't get it. The greater the kingdom encounters, the greater the anointing available. Amen? Amen? Now, just a few months ago, I step off this platform after I'm done talking to different people. I get in my car, and I have a conversation with the Holy Spirit. Not, not audibly, but inside my spirit. You see, <laughs> I have come to understand this. Uh, I've learned how to think out of my spirit. The same way people learn how to think out of their head. And so I'm thinking out of my spirit. And I said to the Holy, I said to the Holy Spirit, I recognize something's different. Something's, di- been, something's been different for the last couple of weeks. What is that? Now, it showed up to me as a, as a new level of confidence, a new level of boldness, a new level of uh, affirmation from him. And I said, what is that? He said, you, you finally arrived at your assignment. I said, what? I've been in ministry for 40 years. He said, you've just stepped into your assignment. I said, you're kidding me. He said, no. I said, well, what is that? He said, God, I've called many people into your ministry, and I've called you to many people to lead them into a relationship with me that is defined by experience to lead them into an experiential relationship because of the days that we live in. Now, not everyone has acquired your level of experiences and and encounters. So I've called you to lead the people, the people that I'm calling into your church and into your ministry, I've called you to lead them into an experiential relationship with that will produce heaven's realities. Amen? And so uh, that gave me even a greater confidence. That great gave me a greater, even a greater affirmation on the inside of me. And, you know, it's like having a father who's always encouraging you, always encouraging you. Yeah, you're doing the right thing. You're going the right direction. This is what you're doing. And I'm here to just say, I've been where you haven't been yet, and I'm going to encourage you to the point where you surpass me. Amen? That's what a good father will do. They want their son to surpass them. Amen? Not that I could ever surpass my heavenly father. None of us could, nor the Holy Spirit, nor Jesus. But he's affirming us, and he's encouraging us, and he's saying, your path forward is this. Your path forward is this. Amen? Now, throughout this, it's taken me years, years, years to explain the, pros- the, the strategy of the process that we've been talking about the last few weeks. It's taking me years. This didn't come overnight. This, and, and see, I'm a speaking spirit, okay? So I don't analyze here, not when it comes to Scripture. I don't process here. I analyze and process in my spirit. And so I have not seen nor ear heard. So I don't get the revelation because my eye has seen it or my ear has heard it. No, I get it from my spirit. See, God who is spirit is speaking to my spirit. So I literally, as a speaking spirit, have to pray up out of my spirit what he's been talking to my spirit about. Are you listening? This is, this is, the, this is how you get pure truth. Amen? This is how you get untainted, unpolluted truth. 
Amen? This is how you get rightly divided word of truth. And if you can rightly divide the word of truth, you can wrongly divide the word of truth. Is it still truth? Yes. But it can be wrongly divided. Have you seen some of that during our election? Come on, somebody. See, and I don't even, I don't even wade into that mess. But some people, they'll take their whole congregation over there into an election issue. And today, they're still fighting the battle that the, that the election has been stolen. Pfft, move on, people. The new guy's fixing to be voted in on the 20th. And you know what? In four years, another guy will be voted in. And that'll be that. Huh? Now, I'm not, stand, I'm not saying don't stand for what's right because it's right and do it right. I'm saying do that. But don't sit there and fight a battle that's already been lost or already been won, depending on which side of the line you stand on. That's all I'm going to say about that now. Man, whew. and then have to, no, I'm not. I, yeah, I'm not done. And then have to stand after it's over, stand up on the platform and justify why they were right and the other people were wrong. That's an ego trip. Anytime you try to save your reputation because you made a statement from this platform, I'm talking about any platform. Anytime you have to stand up there and justify uh, something you've been preaching to a group of people, you're an ego maniac. You're saved, trying to save your reputation and, and, and trying to save face with the people you've been preaching to. That is a bunch of bull. You go there because the Holy Spirit told you to go there, and you leave it alone when he tells you to leave it alone. Now, Jesus got in front of the religious leaders. He got in front of the political leaders, and he opened not his mouth. What would Jesus do? That's what God's going to do. I'm going to do my due diligence. You have the same Holy Spirit I have. The Word of God has been written on the tablets of your heart. You know what is right and what is wrong. Now, you vote according to what the Holy Spirit has told you to do. This is why I've told you, I, I want to be your friend, but I want God to be your friend. And I don't want you to come to me like the children of Israel came to Moses, saying, you, you go find out what God wants from us and then come back and tell us what he wants. No, uh-uh. I said, I won't be that guy for you. I won't be that pastor for you. If you need a pastor to do that, go find somebody else. I'm not that guy. Amen? Because you have a relationship with God, and he is talking to you. Somebody ought to say amen, oh me, or something. Amen? Hallelujah. That's totally off the subject. But I had to go there for some reason. All right. Now, now that's all I've had to say about that. Okay, so I, like I was saying, it has taken me years to recognize the strategy of, the, of this process that we've been talking about the last few weeks in this series, Your Path Forward. Today's session is called Three Encounters. Now, um, it first begins with, like Pastor Doug was saying, an awareness, an awareness over time, it develops, that awareness develops into a deep affection. As it goes from that deep affection, you can see uh, you begin, there's an anointing that's available to be released. It's available. It doesn't mean it is released. It's available to be released. And then fourth and final, it is when you experience. You have the encounter. You have the experience. Amen. Now, let me explain this. Let's look at this first one, awareness. Awareness is when, just, just, just keep that up, awareness. Awareness is when you look to Jesus. You look to him because he is the author of your faith and the finisher of your faith. And since you live, live by faith, that means you have to look to him every day. Amen. You look to Jesus. You look for him. You're aware of when he's active around you. 
you're aware of God. You're aware of the Holy Spirit. And when he is in motion and he's activated and he's moving in our midst, you develop an awareness to that. Amen? An awareness for his presence. A sensitivity towards his presence. Amen? Well, an awareness is not, when I'm aware of him, I don't, I don't affirm him. or I, No, I, I recognize him first and I acknowledge him, not with a gesture, not with a smile or a frown. No, the Bible says to give honor to whom honor is due. Doesn't matter which president is on which side of the aisle, blue or red. When they walk into the cabinet, then what happens is he is announced or she is announced, the president of the United States, and everyone stands. Why do they stand? Because someone more important than me has entered the room. Okay? Our way of standing and affirming. And developing a, a deeper uh, awareness of him is amen. Hallelujah. That's Jesus. Glory be to God. When I feel him moving around me, hallelujah. When that anointing is present, I'm saying amen. Yes, Jesus, that's you. Why? Because I'm affirming, I'm recognizing him that he is and more important than I am. This is how awareness is, awareness is developed. If you, never, if you never build an awareness, you'll never develop a deep affection. You talk about an intimate relationship, that word, that phrase, that is so broad. What does that mean? I'm showing you how to come into intimate relationship with God. You first of all have to build an awareness of Him. Amen? Now, I'm not saying I'm going to physically feel God's presence all the time, but I am saying this. I'm going to feel, physically feel God's presence sometimes. And I'm going to pay attention to the physical signs because God is literally, uh, he's literally ministering with us and, and to me through those physical signs, through my physical senses. Amen? The more, you do, the more you build your awareness, the more your physical senses will come in tune with. In tune with. Amen? When he shows up. When he's manifesting. Amen? Now, this will begin then to develop a deep affection on the inside of you. Because um, when God's presence manifests, you move into an otherworldly place. And he gives you an experience that this world does not offer you, okay? And it affects your soul, it affects your intellect, your mind, it affects your emotions, but more than anything else, it affects your spirit, which is the part of you and the part of me that we, less, we least recognize. But it's true. This is how we develop a deep affection, Amen. Now, as that deep affection happens and we continue to develop it, develop it, develop it, that means we develop our emotions towards him. L listen to this. <laughs> no, I'm going to save it. Yeah, I'll save it. Okay. The next thing is then the anointing is available to be released. How many of you have ever released the anointing? Raise your hand. If you've ever released the anointing, raise your hand. If you've ever released the anointing. And how many of you felt that when you released the anointing? See? That's a part of that, developing that deep affection. He lets you feel it. He could have created the anointing where you never felt it. But he didn't do that. He did that because he wants you to recognize this is a higher power. This came from another dimension. Didn't come from this world. It can't offer you this. Yeah. Amen? It's otherworldly. It's out of this world. Yeah. Amen? It is a brain buster. 
Amen? And then when you release that anointing and it actually produces and you get the testimony of what happened, you go, well, see there? That's God. It develops a deeper affection. A deeper affection. Amen? Now, after one, two, three, all of a sudden, you have either... You, you have either already experienced it or you're in the middle of the experience and your soul gets intertwined with it. Now, once this begins, it's easily continued. It's easily continued. You don't, we, we, we don't think, well, man, I, I just I stepped into a, a lucky spot. Man. I don't know what I did. I just happened upon this. No, you did this. Or a version of this. And that's how the experience became a reality. Somebody ought to give praise in this house. Amen. Amen. Now, I want to show you in Scripture the proof of this. I want to talk about three encounters. Actually, it's one encounter uh, broken out into three parts. And so let's look at it. We know this as the walk of Emmaus. How many of you have ever been on the walk of Emmaus? Yeah, see that? See that? Okay. All right. So you'll understand this. <laughs> but let me see if I can tap in to something you haven't seen before. Amen? In the 24th chapter of Luke, let's look at it. Here's the first encounter. Later that Sunday, two of Jesus' disciples were walking from Jerusalem to Emmaus, a journey of about 17 miles. I bet your journey wasn't 17 miles. And they were in the midst of a discussion about all the events of the last few days when Jesus walked up and accompanied them in their journey. They were unaware that it was Jesus walking alongside them, for God prevented them from recognizing him. Now, let's stop for just a minute. Here it is. First of all, you need to understand... These are not strangers. These people that Jesus are coming, they're not strangers. Jesus is not a stranger to them, and they are not a stranger to Jesus. They know who Jesus is. They're not just acquaintances. They're, they know Jesus. Here he comes alongside them, and he begins to accompany them, and they're totally unaware of who he is. What does this tell us? What's the first step in the process to experience? They're totally aware. Now, the hang-up is this. For God prevented them from recognizing him. Oh, God prevented them. Let me, say, let me tell you something, and, this, and you can study out Scripture to prove if I'm right or wrong. God never hardens a tender heart. Never. He never hardens a sensitive heart. Now we see in the book of Exodus, we see that God hardened Pharaoh's heart. He hardened his heart because Pharaoh's heart was already hard towards God. This tells us the heart condition of these people that he was accompanying on the walk to Emmaus. Their heart was hard which is why they were unaware of him. Now, what hardens our heart? Let's just stop for a minute. Let me explain it to you. Let me tell you what hardens our heart. Remember, the thief comes to steal what? Your heart. Go to Mark, the fourth chapter. He comes to steal the seed that's in the soil of your heart. He, came, he comes to steal the soil of your heart. So the first thing he tries to steal is your heart and your affection and your awareness. And he tries to desensitize you. One of the first ways he steals it is through disappointment. That's disappointment with people. That's disappointment in relationships. That's disappointment in these, these people did me wrong. That's disappointment in God. That's discouragement and living and lingering in discouragement and disappointment for seasons of time. And so it begins to callous over our, the sensitivity of our heart. Are you listening? The devil is a master thief. He is not an honest thief. He is a lying thief. Amen? 
Second thing, this side note, second thing the enemy comes to steal after your heart is your time. He will come to steal your time. Amen. That's another message. Obviously, you can imagine what would hearten our heart is doubt and unbelief. Obviously, we can understand what would harden our heart is lingering question marks. You will find as we continue to read this that that's what's happening with these men, with these, this group of people. They have lingering question marks. They have doubt. They're dealing with unbelief. They're dealing with disappointment. In fact, let's just read it. Let's look at the next uh, verse 17. Jesus said to them, you seem to be in a deep discussion about something. What are you talking about that's so sad and gloomy? Disappointment. Discouragement. You grabbing this? So what does that tell you? Anytime something comes along to disappoint you, you better recognize the enemy is associated with that. He's the trigger man. This is why, and I love caring pastors, and I love caring people and things like that, but, but when someone, someone, someone makes a decision and it could easily disappoint me or it could cause me to go, oh, I, that just makes me sad. No, it doesn't. Because you know who I know the author is of that? The devil. He's the thief. And he ain't tinkering with my emotions. You know why? Or my affections. You know why? Because if he does, he'll callous my heart. Amen. Look at what he says. What are you talking about? So sad and gloomy. And they stopped. So here they're walking. And all of a sudden, that's a holy huddle. And the one named Cleopas answered, Haven't you heard? Or are you the only one in Jerusalem unaware? You think Jesus is unaware? No, they're unaware. Amen. Of the things that have happened over the last few days. Amen. Talking about the crucifixion and the burial. Now, here they are talking <laughs> to Jesus, who's the very person they're talking about, as if he's not even that person. This is how unaware they are. This is how unaware we become. It's, I call it Christianese. I didn't say Chinese. I said Christianese. Amen? Listen, listen to this lyric. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of this earth will grow strangely dim in the light of of his glory and grace. The person, I don't even know who the person was that wrote that, but I guarantee you they wrote it out of an experience with him because you can tell that was written out of a deep affection. That's a deep affection that can write stuff like that. Here are these, here are these group of people that are not strangers to Jesus. They're not even just acquaintances. They know him intimately. And they're totally unaware. They don't even recognize him. Amen. Now let's look at the second part of this encounter. You ready? Early this morning, some of the women informed us of something amazing. They said they went to the tomb and found it empty. And they claimed... In other words, we don't know if this is true or not. Unbelief. Well... Uh, you know, I prayed for you. Now go down to the doctor and, and see if he can verify whether that's doubt. You may have prayed by faith, but when you, when you left it, you left them in doubt. I don't need you to claim anything. I don't need you to go verify anything. If I lay hands on you, you're healed. Amen. Amen. Well, they, 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 <laughs> you know, they said they went to the tomb and found it empty. They claimed that two angels appeared and told them that Jesus is now alive. I think it's interesting that the angel, now you can say what you want, but I found this to be true in years and years and years of being in the church. I think it's interesting that the angels appear to, to women, not to men. It's true. Women are more acceptable and more believing 
and more trusting. You don't have to prove it to me. See, these men were like, prove it to me. But you can have an altar call, and the first people that come down for healing or the first people that come down the altar call, women. I've watched it all my life. Women. Why? Because of the condition of the heart. The condition of the heart. Am I preaching good yet? Amen. Are you getting anything out of this? Now, they claimed two angels appeared and told them that Jesus is now alive. Let's look at verse 24. Some of us went to see for ourselves and found the tomb exactly like the women said. So at least they got that part of the story right. Thank you. But no one has seen him. Jesus interrupted, said to them, why are you so thick-headed? Another translation says, why are you so hard-hearted? Where does this start? The heart condition starts with the process of awareness. And that's up to you and me, whether we ever build that awareness or not. Amen? I want to say some things there, but I'm going to believe it. Why are you so thick-headed? You ever told your husband that? Why are you so, why are you such a meathead? Why are such a, my, my, my uncle and my dad used to call each other fathead. Why are you such a fathead? And I grew up and I had a fat head. So that's why my head is so big today. Fathead. Jeez. Thank you for that confession. Why, why, do you, why do you find it? Here's Jesus. Song. Why do you find it so hard to believe? Every word the prophets have spoken. So here's Jesus having to prove to them who he is. And it's taking a process. He, it's going to take him time. But he's having to prove to them who he is in Scripture in order to soften their heart so their eyes could be opened. Your eyes will not be open until your heart is softened. So you will not see, and I will not see, the many things that are happening in, amongst God's people. And it's all because of a heart condition. I have sat here over the years, <laughs> and, and I've watched this. God moving. I'd see him moving. And he'd be moving on one person, very active around that person. And the person next to him were, couldn't feel a thing. What is it? It's a heart condition. <laughs> Amen. God wants us to have greater encounters so that our faith will come up and equal it. Amen. That's a call to greater faith. Now, <laughs> we're going to have to quit having robotic understanding of what it means to be a follower of Christ. You see, we want to take an unpredictable God and put him in a predictable box of our logic. And, and contain him in the four walls of our predictable logic. And because there at least he's, he's my safe God. And yet he's the most unsafe person in the universe. He is the most unpredictable person in the universe. He is the most dangerous person in the universe. He created that volcano and the streams of lava. He created the universe and the starburst and all the heat coming off the sun and the light coming off the sun. He is dangerous. He is dangerous. He is dangerous. But we want to put him in a safe, quiet place and then bring him out when we need help or when we have a need. No, you'll never develop your awareness for him because awareness is developed during the good times, not the bad times. Amen? That's when the deep affection is also developed. Amen? And so 
we have to recognize that I have to leave behind my robotic understanding of what it means to be a follower of Christ. And the way that I do that is I stop um, allowing my logic to be shaped by the opinions of men. And I allow my logic to be shaped by putting God's presence as the highest value in my life. What's what's the highest value in my life? Not the Bible. God's presence. How is it that the early church was able to accomplish all that it was able to accomplish over 3,000 in Jerusalem that first day? Over 3,000 got saved. And they did it without a Bible. They did it with the power of the Holy Spirit. That's why. Where did they place their highest value? Not in the Word of God. They placed their highest value in God's presence. Are you listening to me? Because where we're going, we have to have a cultural shift. What God wants to do is culturally with us. And so that means a breaking off of some old things. See, we put, again, let me go back to this box, this unpredictable God that we put in predictable box. And so we pray the same prayer all the time. You need to know that that prayer of repetition doesn't produce anything. In fact, I remember the day the Holy Spirit said to me, He said, if your prayer is the same tomorrow as it is today, you had not grown at all. And you're certainly not allowing me to lead you in your prayer life. Now, you may interchange some of the, some scriptures. Amen? Because that's what you know. But he said, your prayer language should always be changing. Always be changing. How do you know it's changing? Because it didn't come from you. It came from your spirit, man. And you, I, you don't even know what he's going to say through you. Instead of having canned prayers. Well, I got an answer out of that one last time. I'll get another one. No, you won't. No, you won't. That soda pop, that Coca-Cola, that Pepsi, that Curves, that Budweiser, you can pop the lid on that sucker and it tastes the same. Every can tastes the same. God is not the same way like that. He is the same yesterday, today, forever. But he, but, but he manifests himself to us differently all the time. He's the God doesn't need to change. I need to change. And so he, need, he knows exactly what I need to do. He needs to do in my life to change me today. And let me tell you, the wisdom that you had that got you where you're at is not the wisdom that's going to take you where you need to go. Come on. Amen? (laughs) Hallelujah. Let's look at the third encounter. I'm looking across this room. Third encounter. Joining them at the table for supper, he took bread and blessed it and broke it and then gave it to them. And all at once, their eyes were open and they realized, it's Jesus. Then suddenly in a flash, Jesus vanished from before their eyes. So they literally had to, ha- they literally had to hear Jesus pray something that he had prayed before. They had to hear him pray something he had prayed before. They had to see him do something that he had done before, before they finally realized, that's Jesus. Huh. Huh. Do you have to have God do something he's done before? Say something you've heard him say before, before you realize it's God? God's in that? Are you listening? Because it's one thing to talk about signs, it's one thing to talk about and sing about. Signs, wonders, miracles, healings, the kingdom dimension, receiving results out of the invisible realm and receiving unseen things, calling things that be not as though they were. We don't call things that be as, as if they be. We call them into existence. Amen? It's one thing to talk about that and sing about that. It's another thing for it to manifest in our life. Amen. 
Now, Jesus vanished from their eyes. Wow. This, so look, at, look here. Here's Jesus. Here he is. He's having conversation with them for 17 miles. That's a long conversation. We're, we're going to go, we're, we're going to be at this a while. 17 miles. They're walking. They don't have a car. They don't have a scooter. They're walking. They're at this for hours. And all this time, they do not recognize him until he sits down and he breaks bread and he blesses it. And then all of a sudden. And then as soon as he does that, he has this conversation with them. He's looking in their eyes face to face. And they do, they're completely unaware that this is Jesus. What does that tell us about our challenge? Hmm? You're going to have to be purposeful about building your awareness, about developing your deep affection, about recognizing the, available, the availability of the anointing that's ready to be released so that you can enter into the experience and have the encounter. Some of you today, you're in relationships with people and you don't have a shot at bringing them into wholeness without them having an encounter with God. It's going to require an experience. In order for him to become real, in order for them to get snapped out of whatever it is that they're dealing with in their soul, they have a soul issue or they have a daddy, a, a daddy issue. Uh, or they just have a, a series of disappointments and a series of discouragement, and they have suicidal thoughts and suicidal tendencies. The only thing that's going to save them, rescue them, is an encounter with God, and those encounters are going to come through you. The many people that God wants to bring into this house are waiting on you to engage in this process. Are you listening? The process of awareness, deep affection, the anointing available to be released, and the experience. And it's your process not theirs, theirs, that's going to bring them into the encounter. You see, I want every part of my being to be utilized by God so I can be prepared and available in every situation. So if he wants to move among us by giving us physical signs, then... That tells us he's communicating with us in the physical dimension. This is what you've been praying for, believing God for, wanting God to manifest and do in your life. And now it's your opportunity to see it happen. But he doesn't want you to be a bystander. He wants you to be, a, he wants you to be the spearhead. He wants you to be the reason for it. I'm speaking to lay ministers now. Those of you who recognize your redemptive gifts, those who have a hunger and thirst for their redemptive gifts, a hunger and thirst for their, their spiritual giftings. This is, how you have, this is how you become highly developed in it, highly skilled in it. Amen? Hallelujah. Now, notice what happens next. Very interesting. Remember, he just vanished. He's there in flesh and bone body. And all of a sudden, he disappears. That's a trip. Now, that's a pretty, that's a pretty, amazing, that's a pretty amazing experience, isn't it? Let's look at what they say. Now. Stunned, you can just imagine. They looked at each other and said, Why didn't we recognize him? As I kept reading, I got stuck on that. I got stuck on that, that, that little section right there. And the Holy Spirit said to me, you know what they're implying? 
I said, tell me, Holy Spirit, you're the teacher. He said the implication of this statement, and rightfully so, is that they, rec- they realized that they, if they would have had awareness and that if they would have recognized Jesus right off, they would have had a completely different experience. And it would have been a multiplied experience many times over. See, we think this is pretty spectacular. He's there and then he vanishes. It pales in comparison what he wanted to do. I have stood from this platform over the years and I've said, God is here. And this is the response I got. Where's the awareness? How, how, how do we affirm our, that we're aware? One who's more honorable and more magnificent is in the room. How do we affirm him? Amen. Thank you, Corey. That's Jesus. Praise God. Hallelujah. That's how you recognize him verbally. You don't recognize him with a gesture. You can. But you should give voice to it. Praise God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Yes, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. God is here. I said God is here. He's in our midst right now. And it, and it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Here came the Holy Spirit, and he impacted the world, with, and he began with 120 people. God's not afraid of starting with something small. It's a small group of people. Amen? But if you study out the upper room experience, those 10 days, what do you see? This process, awareness, deep affection, the anointing, here comes the experience. You don't get there without that. You don't get there without that. Amen? Why didn't we recognize him? Didn't our hearts burn with flames of holy passion while we walk beside him. See, he's manifesting himself to them. What do we see happening on the inside of them? Their hearts are burning. They recognize there's a holy passion rising up on the inside of them, and yet still they won't recognize him. And they won't say, oh, I'm aware of who you are. They won't do it. That's a heart condition. That's pride. That's spiritual pride. And yet, there was the confirmation of it. The heart's burning. (laughs) A holy passion rose up on the inside of them. (laughs) Amen. Confirmation, 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 confirmation. I can hear Jesus thinking out loud right now. What else do you need, guys? What else do you need, people? And the Lord will do the same thing to us. And he does the same thing to us. Amen? And then guess what? He'll vanish. He'll disappear. Because we didn't recognize him quick enough. You want a lingering manifestation of the presence of God? You're going ha- to have to get in this process. And you're going to have to let it become your life. You mean in, in, in my business? Uh-huh. On the job? Uh-huh. Absolutely. When I'm praying and when I'm not praying. Amen? Awareness. Oh, that, uh, God did that. I couldn't have done that. God did that. The Lord did that. The Holy Spirit spoke to that person. I talked to, there was somebody I talked to here a while back. They were in a, they were in a, a deep problem. And uh, I literally, I said, before I called him, I said, Holy Spirit, think through my mind, speak through my lips. None of this is of me. All of this is of you. Hit the send button. Got him on the phone. 
preach to them for 20 minutes. They texted me back about an hour later and said, I just want to tell you how much I thank you because everything you said was exactly what, it, what I needed to hear to pull me up out of this problem. And so last night about 2.30 in the morning, I get this, I begin to get these words from the Lord about a, uh, about a person. I can't go into what he said, but it was a four-sentence rhyme. And it was very serious about their life, about their specific life. You could even call it a life and death situation. Now, this is not the first time the Lord has given me words for people. If you've been here long enough, you've heard me testify of several things that the Lord's had me literally go to places, you know, many hours away, travel, get in the car, travel, just to deliver a word from God. Not my word, because my word was, I don't want to go. My second word is, I don't want to spend the money on gas. My third word, it's a waste of time. They ain't going to listen to me anyway. My fourth word was, okay, I'll do it. That's exactly how it goes every time. Okay, I'll do it. And so I woke up this morning. I told Missy, this is what the Lord told me about this certain individual. And she went, oh. I could see it all over her face. I said, oh, you feel, you feel the weight of that, don't you? Oh, she said, yeah, I do. That word is weighty. When a word comes out of the invisible realm, it always has a weight to it. It's weighty. Like this word today. Do you feel the weight on it? It's got a power behind it. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Don't, get, don't be late. You, can't, you cannot move forward in the spiritual dimension and be a lazy Christian. Now, I said this last week, and it's true. And then I'll have him bring this scripture back up, and we'll finish this. <clears throat> Growing up, there were two camps of, you could call it denominations. And they were emotional. They may have gone to the extreme even. Okay? But a mainstream religion came along and gave them a label. And when they did, they threw the baby out with the bathwater. And they ostracized those two camps. Now, the truth is, I've been in every camp there is. Methodist, Baptist, Church of Christ, Assembly of God, Pentecostal, Word of Faith, Charismatic. I believe one of the reasons that the, the Holy Spirit led me into those different camps, I'm calling them camps, is because he wanted me to taste every single one of them to measure the truth and the, and the reality of each one of them. What kingdom reality, what parts of the kingdom reality are in this? Okay. But, man, these, these people over here got a bad rap. Because, and, and, and I, I was over there. I mean, I've, I've been in there. I remember the day my, my, uh, my sisters and my mom, their hair went up. I think that's interesting that that's trendy now. It's vogue. But their hair went up. The earrings and the makeup came off. And if a house needs paint and paint it, I say, but man, they stripped that paint off, man. I was like, who are you? I don't, I don't even recognize you. <laughs> it's true. It's the funniest thing. I saw, I saw more signs and miracles 
come out of those two camps, Pentecostal and Assembly of God. Now, they're not like they used to be, okay? Because they had a deep affection. And we've got to restore that back to the house of God. Amen? Well, where does that start, Scott? By you becoming aware? Amen? When your heart burns? When a holy passion rises up? When you're recognizing the anointing? Oh, that's Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. You, you, look, you're not going to bother me. Go for it. You're not going to affect me and my ability to... See, Jesus said, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Listen. Whether you know this or not, and I told my pastor this, pastors this a couple of weeks ago, you are, each one of you are called to an out of the abundance of the heart ministry. When I get up here, I speak out of the abundance of my heart. The day the Holy Spirit said, don't go up there with notes anymore. I want you to speak out of the abundance of your heart. Isn't that we've, what we've been doing? Some of you have been here the whole journey. You saw me. Stop bringing the lectern up here. Stop bringing the notes up here. Boom, it's gone. Here I am. It's out of the abundance of the heart's ministry. That's what God called to each one of us to. Why? So he can utilize us in every situation. Amen. Now let's look at this one more time and then we'll finish. This last verse. While we, while we walk beside him, he unveiled for us such profound revelations. Revelation from the scriptures. I want to tell you the two most profound, profound things that you will ever that you will ever receive as a result of this process. Two things. Revelation and wisdom. And we're going to talk about that and what that actually means. Because revelation, just the idea of revelation has been kept in a general sense and never been deeply defined. We're going to define what revelation is. It's going to change your, it's going to change your logic. It's going to change your understanding. See, what's so important about this is what you don't understand is as important as what you do understand. And it's what you don't understand that's keeping you and keeping me from where he wants us to go. That's why he said, and with all that getting, get understanding. Now, why did Jesus... He was there one moment, and why did he vanish? Why did he disappear? Well, first of all, he came to show them their lack of awareness. Yeah. It became obvious to them at that point. Oh, we, we just weren't aware. Amen. Then he also, it showed them their lack of faith. It showed them that they had allowed disappointment in what happened in the physical realm to rob them of what he told them in the word of God. He prophesied it to them and they forgot all about it because they got caught up in the moment of what was happening and they lost sight of and lost their faith in the word. Amen. Here disappointment came. Here discouragement came. Boom. Here comes a hard heart. And I'm unable to recognize Jesus. Amen. The other thing that it taught them and showed them as well as us is that we are to be as present for him as he is to us. We are to be available to him at all times. Just like we want him to be available to us. But typically, we want him available to us when we need him and not what we want him and not when we don't. And he says, no, I'm going to be there more often when you don't need me than when you do need me. And that's when you need to get it. He will manifest 
in the people's lives around us? And will we recognize how active he is in our midst? Did you get anything out of this today? Give the Lord praise in this house. Look at, look at, uh, <laughs> look at your next step, our next steps. I will get my mind and my physical senses into alignment with kingdom realities. That's a mouthful. But take it into consideration and context in which we've talked about today. I will get my mind, my physical senses into alignment with kingdom realities. Amen. Is my, do, do I possess a mind, a thought life, a logic that is, that is resistant to his anointing and his presence? Or do I possess a mind, a mindset, a logic, a thought life that is welcoming? To his presence. Again, the fact that he is not a practical God, he's an impractical God. He's not a safe God. He's not my servant. Hey, go get me. Go get me and meet my needs. Go, go, go. And then that's the only conversation I have with him. Amen. No, I'm here to worship Him. I'm here to obey Him. I'm here to serve Him. I'm here to pursue Him. I'm here to love Him. I'm here to be at His beck and call. I'm here to do whatever He tells me to do when He tells me to do it. Amen. In order to accomplish that, I have to be aware. Aware. Bow your head and close your eyes. Father, thank you for being in our midst today. Thank you for being among us. Thank you that in this session today and even those watching online, there's a holy passion that rose up on the inside of us. There was a burning sensation that took place in their heart. Father, that we recognize you. That that we are always aware of you. That we develop a deep affection. That we recognize when the anointing is available to be released. That we experience you. So you're no longer a name written on the pages of the Bible. But you're the name written in the script of our lives. God is here. God was here. God was here. God manifested there. God healed there. God prevented that. God safeguarded me there. God blessed me there. God helped me there. God saved me there. God rescued me from that. God did this for me. God produced that result. God gave me that answer. God gave me that wisdom. God gave me that solution. Oh, I could not have done it. I could not have done it without you. And I'm not oblivious. (laughs) You're the author and you're a finisher. And we give you thanks, Father. Go ahead and stand if you would. As you're standing, praise God. As you're standing, worship God. As you're standing, give Him praise and thanksgiving. Honor Him today. Now, the Lord is here. If you can sense the Lord today, I want you to say amen. Amen. Yeah. Now, he's here on purpose, and he didn't come empty-handed. He's here with the blessing. No, a specific blessing to those that are here today and those that are listening to me today there's a specific blessing that God wants to impart to you today
So as we sing this by faith, I want you to make a connection to it. Connect with your heart. If you can't connect with your heart, connect with your intellect. It's okay. Connect with your head. Connect with your thought life. Listen to the lyrics. Let them get on the inside of your thought life. Let them work their way down into your soul, into your spirit. This is what the Lord has for you today. The blessing. 